nuclear worry. An at-risk power plant in Ukraine has Western leaders on edge. We're at the White House. Catholic Church in Nicaragua. Pope Francis reacts to the arrest of a bishop and several clergy. Afghanistan anniversary. Evaluating Taliban control after almost a year. We speak with a former U.S. ambassador. And religious persecution. We examine the plight of millions who suffer in the world's most affected countries. On EWTN News Nightly for Monday, August 22nd, 2022. Thank you so much for being with us tonight on this feast of the Queenship of Blessed Virgin Mary. I'm Tracy Sable. The Biden administration raises the alarm about potential nuclear disaster with reports of shelling around Europe's biggest nuclear plant. It comes six months after Russia's unrelenting invasion of Ukraine. White House correspondent Owen Jensen reports. Owen. Tracy, good evening to you. President Biden and leaders from France, Britain, and Germany are keeping a very close eye on the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant in Ukraine. They're issuing a plea to keep the bombs from falling near it. Ukraine's main nuclear power plant, a huge global concern tonight. The White House says President Joe Biden and his counterparts in France, Germany, and the United Kingdom discussed the situation at the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, including the need to avoid military operations near the plant and the importance of an IAEA visit as soon as feasible to ascertain the state of safety systems. Potentially, The chief of the International Atomic Energy Agency warns... The risk is very big, of course. Uh, we have said it. It's known. The plant, which has six reactors that require cooling, needs stability, even as war rages all around. And there is nothing uh, normal in the middle of a war. So uh, the danger uh, that something may go astray or something um, unexpected may happen is, um, of course, unsustainable. Also, Russia blames Ukrainian intelligence for killing the daughter of a Russian nationalist ideologue in a weekend car bombing outside Moscow. Ukraine denies the allegation. And Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky warned that Russia might be planning another major attack. Iran represents another nuclear concern, this one involving nuclear weapons. World powers are in their final round of negotiations to restore Tehran's tattered 2015 nuclear deal. An Iranian foreign ministry spokesman saying the United States has not responded to the latest European proposal. The White House added in its statement that President Biden and the leaders of France, Germany and the UK discussed the need to strengthen support for partners in the Middle East region and joint efforts to deter and constrain Iran's destabilizing regional activities. Now back to that nuclear power plant in Ukraine. Russia is asking for an urgent meeting of the U.N. Security Council tomorrow to discuss the situation. Meanwhile, President Biden returns to the White House on Wednesday. At the White House, Owen Jensen, EWTN News Nightly. Well, election officials in Kansas confirmed that a pro-life ballot measure was defeated earlier this month. Fewer than 100 votes changed after a partial hand recount. The proposed amendment called Value Them Both addressed a 2019 state Supreme Court ruling that recognized a right to abortion under the Kansas Constitution. The referendum failed by 18%. Pope Francis is calling for dialogue and peaceful coexistence between Nicaragua's government and its people. During Sunday remarks at the Vatican, the Pope also expressed his sorrow for the situation in the country. Last Friday, a Catholic bishop and several clergy were arrested. The government also recently shut down several church-owned radio stations. Coming up later in the newscast, we'll have analysis from Mike Gonzalez of the Heritage Foundation. Are we approaching the one-year anniversary of the official U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan? And under the new Taliban government, life has become increasingly more difficult. The country is dealing with an economic collapse, the continuous threat by ISIS, and a sharp cut in aid from international organizations. And among the groups feeling the effects the most are religious minorities.
Joining us now is Ambassador Sam Brownback, former U.S. Ambassador at Large for International Religious Freedom. Ambassador Brownback, great to see you as always. Um, if you don't mind, can you give us a sense of what life is like for religious minorities under the Taliban rule? You know, we've heard there are reports that Christians and even some Muslims are being hunted down by the Taliban. They are. Uh, they are in hiding. They're trying to get to safe houses or uh, moving from different houses. Um, give you a little bit of a context right now. There are zero Hindus left in Afghanistan, none. And there are just over 100 Sikhs left, and they are trying to get out. Uh, and the ones that uh, can are getting out. And Christians are in hiding. Uh, Hazara uh, Muslims that are Shia Muslims are being hunted down as well. I mean, th this is a genocide of all religious minorities that don't agree with the Taliban. That's what you're seeing take place now. A really terrible situation there. What do you think the Biden administration and also the international community, what do you think they can do to help? And what do you think should be done? Uh, they need to prioritize for visas religious minorities. Uh, this is something that they can do. They have it in their power to do. We have about 1,500 uh, religious minorities, primarily Christians and Hazara uh, Muslims that are left in humanitarian city in Abu Dhabi, uh, but they're stuck uh, and they won't prioritize their visa processing. They've been cleared. They've been gotten out of Afghanistan uh, by different groups that have paid for their way to get them out just to get them to safety, but they need to be prioritized. They need to be granted visas to be able to get into the United States or at least working with other Western countries to get them placed there. If that doesn't happen, what will happen to them, do you think? Well, the ones left in Afghanistan, I, I don't know. I, I think they're just, they're going to be hunted down. If the Taliban don't get you, the other people will get you. There are other religious, I mean, there are other uh, Muslim groups in there that are hunting them down as well. And if out of a humanitarian city, they're not going to be taken in uh, by Abu Dhabi and the community writ large. They've got to be placed somewhere. Uh, and that's where I really think the United States, working with Canada, the UK, other Western countries, Brazil, need to take them and need to take them now. Yeah, you know, something else I want to talk about, I know, you know, you've, you know this, uh, last year the Taliban indicated that its role will be different from when it ran the country back in the late 1990s and early 2000s. Uh, for those who may not remember, um, can you tell us what life was like under the Taliban rule back then and have things changed now? Can a tiger change his stripes? Um, I, I just, I don't believe it. They haven't done it. And what it was like then was if you didn't agree with their philosophy as a Sunni Muslim, as a radical Sunni Muslim terrorist, uh, you could be killed and were ostracized and run out. Uh, family members were killed and hunted down. Women couldn't go to a school. They couldn't leave the house uh, without a male escort. That's the same sort of philosophy that's still being executed and exercised in many areas in Afghanistan. Uh, and it, it's just without repercussion. It's like the world has turned its face and its gaze another place. It said, OK, we tried for a long time. It didn't work. We're going to go somewhere else. And people are left and they get killed and they're dying. Mm. It's so tough. It's hard to imagine. I want to switch gears here before we let you go and talk about some things happening here in the United States. Um, as we reported earlier, uh, there was confirmation over the weekend that the pro-life value them both amendment in Kansas was shot down by voters. Uh, you're the former governor of Kansas, as many people know. I'm curious, why do you think the measure failed? And what could pro-lifers maybe do in the future on votes like this? You know, I, I thought Peggy Noonan had a really good article uh, on this in the Wall Street Journal about, you know, here you've had uh, 50 years of Roe versus Wade, basically, uh, and now you had a radical shift. Uh, the Dobbs case took place. Six weeks later, you have this public vote in Kansas. The other side was really exercised and motivated. There was a lot of deception, a lot of misleading that took place. I think we're just really going to have to go out and, and back up working, continuing to work at changing hearts and minds and take incremental steps uh, on forward is what I, I think we have to learn from this, what happened in the state of Kansas. We're not giving up. We're not quitting. Uh, life remains sacred. It means remains sacred from the very beginning to the very end. And we're going to continue to fight for that. Well, we're going to leave it right there. Ambassador Brownback, thank you so much, as always, for your time and for your insights. We appreciate it.
My pleasure to join you. Well, people in Kenya await the results of a contested presidential election. Candidate Raylo Odingo came up short on votes and just filed a Supreme Court challenge. He claims the process was marked by criminal subversion, and now he wants judges to nullify the original vote and redo the election. The country's deputy president, William Ruto, was earlier declared the winner. Well, at least 40 people have died from flash flooding across India, triggered by monsoon conditions over the past few days. Landslides have displaced hundreds, especially from mountain villages in a northern Himalayan state. And in Sudan, scores of people have died from rising waters along the Nile River. Nearly 15,000 homes are now destroyed. A United Nations humanitarian agency believes this year's seasonal floods have affected around 136,000 people. Coming up, a conservative Republican in a blue district makes her case to win a seat in the U.S. House. Plus, taking to heart the suffering endured by victims of religious persecution worldwide. America's top infectious disease expert plans to retire in December. Dr. Anthony Fauci gained fame during the COVID-19 pandemic, but he also became the subject of fierce criticism. President Joe Biden praised Dr. Fauci today, calling him a dedicated public servant who left the United States more resilient. While many political analysts see Virginia as a battleground state in November's midterm elections, and one race that is being closely watched there is between incumbent Democrat Abigail Spanberger and GOP challenger Yesley Vega. Capitol Hill correspondent Eric Rosales takes a closer look. I'm in Culpeper, Virginia, the central part of the state where Republicans are looking to take back the House with several key races, including this one, the 7th Congressional District. I am a pro-life uh, candidate. I will always uh, stand and defend life, the most vulnerable in the womb. And so for me, it's very important for people to understand where my heart is uh, when it comes to that issue. I believe also in protecting women and in ensuring that they have all of the resources that they need. Born to Salvadorian immigrants fleeing a civil war, Yesley Vega is a Christian, a mother, and tells me why she became a police officer. I got into law enforcement because my younger brother, Eric, was gunned down and nearly killed by MS-13 during a gang initiation process. During that vicious attack, uh, he lost his best friend, Anthony. He was murdered at the age of 15, not just sharing stories that people have shared with me or that perhaps I read in the paper. I've walked in those shoes. I've lived through those moments uh, that have been very difficult for my family, for my brother to overcome, and that we're still dealing you know, the, with, with the aftermaths of, of that traumatic experience. She turned in her badge four years ago for a seat on the Prince William County, Virginia Board of Supervisors and now hopes to bring her experiences to Capitol Hill. So your faith plays a very important role in who you are and how you vote. I've dedicated my life to public service. You know, my, my, my father is a pastor, so I grew up in church. I'm a woman of faith. Uh, and so everywhere I go, I try to look at life and govern, you know, through my faith. I caught up with her at a police round table in Culpeper, Virginia. Safety and security of our communities, I think, in this society in general are paramount uh, for a successful uh, uh, society, if you will. She talked about the Biden administration's open border policy and the effects fentanyl is having on communities. She tells tells me more needs to yes. be done. We have to do better, right, uh, to ensure that what's happening at the border uh, ceases to stop. I mean, from, you know, the drugs that are pouring into our country to the trafficking of women, children, men, cartels are, 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 are having their way. With her husband a Border Patrol agent, she disagrees with Democrat efforts to defund the police. Her opponent, Congresswoman Spamberger, has also been an outspoken Democrat critic of that movement. Yesley Vega tells me that's not the position of many Democrats. Uh, we've seen over the last couple of years the push that the Democrat Party has made in demonizing the brave men and women in law enforcement. Uh, there is distrust, and I think that it's absolutely unfair because a lot of the men and women uh, that are serving in this capacity as officers, as deputies, uh, are doing so because they love their communities. And on the economy, she describes herself as a fiscal hawk. You keep going back to the same well, which is the taxpayers. At what point do we put our foot down and we say enough is enough? 
President Biden has taken a position on 73 bills and resolutions in the U.S. House, and Congresswoman Spamberger has supported all of them. One only has to look at her voting record, and that tells you exactly who she is. She is far from being a moderate. She has supported Joe Biden every single step of the way. She has voted with him 100 percent of the time. It's important to note that EWTN News Nightly reached out to Congresswoman Abigail Spamberger for a comment. She declined an on-camera interview. From Culpeper, Virginia, Eric Rosales, EWTN News Nightly. Well, today, the United Nations commemorates the International Day for the Victims of Acts of Violence Based on religion or belief. The General Assembly recalled that states have the primary responsibility to protect the human rights of religious minorities. Statistics show more than 360 million Christians worldwide experience a high level of persecution and discrimination because of their faith. All right, let's go now to Sean Nelson, legal counsel for Global Religious Freedom with ADF International. Sean, great to have you on. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about this International Day, as well as more about those who are suffering the most right now around the world when it comes to religious persecution? Well, thank you, Tracy, for having me on. And the United Nations International Day, it commemorates the victims of violence based on religion or belief. So uh, this whole day is about those victims, those people who are being persecuted the worst, facing uh, torture, facing imprisonment, facing even death for their religious beliefs, for being a Christian, for being a Muslim. Uh, and we find this in, in, a, in a lot of places. Uh, unfortunately, the, the worst People who experience persecution uh, when it comes to religious believers are Christians. It's over 300 million Christians around the world live somewhere where they can experience high levels of persecution. Uh, and that's in every region, really, um, predominantly in the Middle East, throughout Asia, and throughout Africa. But we see it in, in many other areas as well. Now, Christians are not the only people who are experiencing religious persecution. Uh, a lot of minority Muslims in many different countries, you think of the Uyghurs in China, in Xinjiang, they are basically being held in, in concentration camps by a communist government that is extremely hostile to religious beliefs. Uh, and the same thing down in Myanmar with the Rohingya Muslims, you have other minority uh, faiths like the Amani Muslims, uh, Baha'is, Hindus in Pakistan. Sean, another thing I want to talk about, I understand that ADF uh, recently produced a documentary about a Pakistani Christian couple uh, who was languishing on death row for seven years on false blasphemy charges. Uh, can you tell us more about that? And also, why was it so important to tell their story? Pakistan's blasphemy laws are amongst the worst in the world. The, the You have politicians who are killed regularly for defending people like Shafkat and Shagufta, for defending people like Asya Bibi. It's a very dangerous situation where you can have any allegation, whether true or false or anything, can lead to massive mobs and significant violence, threats of death, actual killings against people, and especially against Christians. So we were very, very thankful that the international community spoke up on their behalf. In 2021, the European Parliament made a resolution defending Shafkat and Shagufta and calling for their release. And very shortly after that, the Lahore High Court did find that acquittal. But because of the dangerous situation, because of the threats that they faced, they had to secretly leave the country. But now they're in Europe. Thankfully, they were able to make it there. And earlier this year, they spoke at the European Parliament to talk about their story, talk about how they are not the only people facing these kinds of blasphemy sentences. There are, are dozens, and there have been hundreds and hundreds over the years who have faced this exact kind of thing, many of them Christians, but not all of them Christians. And it's something that the international community really has to take a stand for. They have to stand for freedom of religion. They have to stand for freedom of speech. They have to stand against this kind of violence. That's why this International Day is so important. That's why Shagufta and Shafkat's story is so important. And it's wonderful that they're able to tell that story through a documentary, and we hope people are able to view that. All right. Well, Sean, thank you so much for speaking with us, and thank you for all that you do. We appreciate it. God bless. Up next, the narrow gate. Pope Francis unlocks the meaning to one of Jesus' most challenging teachings.
we reported earlier, the Vatican is weighing in on the situation in Nicaragua, where President Daniel Ortega's government continues to target the Catholic Church and clergy, including the recent arrest of a bishop and the shutting down of several church-owned radio stations. We go now to Mike Gonzalez, a senior fellow at the Heritage Foundation. Mike, thanks so much for coming on. We appreciate it. So what's the latest in the situation in Nicaragua? What can you tell us? Well, as you said, uh, uh, Bishop uh, Rolando Alvarez was kidnapped in Matagalpa last Friday, and he was not alone. They also took other priests. This is but the latest action out of many. The Nicaraguan government, the, the dictatorship of the Danny Ortega, is now an, an out-and-out war with Catholics in this country. Uh, Catholicism it comprises about 60 percent of the population. It goes back to 2018 when there were uh, uh, the protests again against his dictatorship, and he's never liked the church anyway. He's a real Marxist, uh, Danny Ortega. He obviously was the, the leader of the Sandinistas in the 80s. So this is, has been going for a long time, and it's a uh, it, it, it's a real repression. I mean, one of the most repressive states against the church right now is at our doorstep, and the Biden administration wants to put, play nice with them. Now, we know um, that the bishop is under house arrest, but what about the clergy uh, who are arrested? Do we know where they are, what their situation is? No, we do not know. I, I don't think so. I think that what we hear is that they're, they, they, they have been arrested by the government, but, uh, but to me, that was just a kidnapping. Uh, look, this has happened for a long time. Uh, uh, you know, Silvio Baez, Monsignor Silvio Baez, had to flee the country uh, two years ago uh, when the U.S. Embassy warned them that he's about to be arrested. He had been beaten up already. As you know, 18 nuns of the, uh, the Sisters of Charity were kicked out of the country. Uh, Ortega feels he can do anything he wants now. He is faced with a very weak administration in Washington with the State Department that doesn't seem to understand Latin America or, or the Marxist takeover of the, of the hemisphere is very ill-equipped to deal with this. And Mike, I'm curious, um, is this the first time that Catholic leaders have been targeted uh, over there in Nicaragua? <laughs> no, no. Uh, we, we know even in the, uh, uh, when the dictator was Anastasio Somoza, he also targeted, uh, and he was not a dictator of the left. He was a dictator of the right. He also targeted the, the Catholic Church. This is not, not a new thing, but not at this level. This is now sustained targeting of the Catholic Church. Uh, you know, back in the 80s, Daniel Ortega uh, had a couple of priests in his cabinet, uh, Cardenas and Miskel Descato uh, Brockman. Uh, but that was then and this is now. Uh, this is now a very Marxist uh, fight with the church. Uh, to be honest, uh, Pope Francis should be should be elevating this. He hasn't. Yeah, we know, and we did report that Pope Francis addressed this issue yesterday. Um, I also want to talk about the Biden administration and the international community. Um, what about them? I mean, if they said anything about the targeting of Catholic churches, and what do you think should be done? I think the Congress should start thinking of hitting uh, Nicaragua with more sanctions. We cannot expect anything out of this White House, out of the National Security Council, or from the State Department. Biden is just trying to reach out to Nicaragua the same way he has reached out to, to, to Venezuela, two Marxist dictatorships. The Biden administration seems only to be at war with Guatemala, a country that, uh, with a president who's pro-life, pro-American. Uh, and this obviously bothers, you know, uh, President Biden, Kamala Harris, Susan Rice, and the rest of the Biden administration. But they, they don't seem to be as bothered by what is taking place in Nicaragua. But it's very serious. Congress should take a, should take a look and exercise some oversight. All right, Mike, we have to leave it right there. But thank you so much for coming on and weighing, and we appreciate it. Thank you. Well, finally tonight, Pope Francis reminds the faithful that Christians are measured by how well they follow Jesus Christ and the gospel. Bisogna passare attraverso di lui. At a Sunday address, the Holy Father encouraged the pilgrims to strive to enter through the narrow door, meaning that to enter into God's life and salvation, we need to pass through him. And we thank you for watching tonight. For the entire EWTN News Nightly team, I'm Tracy Sable. Good night and God bless.